Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Charles Vermeulen, CEO and co-founder of Linksino, and I am extremely happy, pleased, honored, excited to be today with Abby, who is the executive director of a um, long-term care home, a community in um, in, in Toronto, Canada. I, uh, this is the second session of our Activities Strong 4 gathering. And Abby and I will discuss and share a little bit about It Begins with a Resident, which falls under today's theme of getting to know our residents. So before we get started, I just had a couple um, announcement, housekeeping things that we need to explain, which is, one, um, today you can earn up to three NAB, NCAP, and or NCCDPCU that are available. Now, to earn the credits, you need to attend the full session, as few as one session, and as many of the three sessions today. And you need to fill the required post-summit CEU survey, which will be made available in the chat or uh, emailed to you uh, and to all attendees, actually, on September 15th. You need to fill out the survey by midnight Thursday, September 15th. So that's midnight Eastern time. And CEU certificates will be emailed by the end of the day on Wednesday, September 23rd. As a reminder, this session is currently being recorded and we will be sharing the recording for free afterwards so you can share it with your team or uh, listen to key aspects if you uh, so want. Now, the third item, uh, as you probably saw, I was not, we were not able to activate uh, the Facebook Live, unfortunately. But as uh, you know, on Zoom, that's item number four, we have uh, two features. We have the chat and the Q&A. As you've probably seen, the Q&A is very active. Um, please continue so. This is fantastic. Um, but if you have questions and answers for the speakers, Abby or myself, uh, please put them in the uh, Q&A feature of uh, Zoom. So in other words, we will monitor, uh, I mean, not vaguely, but we will monitor the chat, uh, but the Q&A is where we'll pick up questions for Abby and myself. And the last item for the people that are participate in, participating in today's uh, bingo game, um, the bingo word of this session right now is R. Right. You need the word R if you want to participate in uh, today's being a session. So I see a lot of activity on the chat. Hi, Pam. Hi, Chris. Hi, Cassandra. Hi, Glenda. Let me change to our uh, presentation uh, that Abby and I will be uh, sharing with you. And we're going to get started now. So as I explained before, um, the first part of resident engagement, and you know, sometimes people say, you know, it, it's probably the hardest. Actually, Amy said it well. It's the one where we have some of our biggest challenges, is how we get to know our residents. And actually, this is the title of our presentation, which is, it begins with the residents, right? They are the reason why we're here, and we are here to serve them and to honor their preferences and help them find purpose every day. Um, it's a source of purpose, right? And it is also something that we continuously improve. I am uh, joined today by Abby, who has, as I said, fantastic glasses. But let me share a few things that are beyond uh, the bio here. Abby, for me, is one of the best and most passionate and smart, and I do mean it, Abby, uh, and also driven uh, professional in resident engagement. 
I had the pleasure of meeting Abby probably four years ago, five years ago. We partnered on the um, on on a huge study, like a clinical study that was funded by Baycrest, where we were able to measure the impact of resident engagement on clinical quality of life and financial outcome. And it was such a great uh, study results that we were actually published late last year in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, I think, Abby, you also like skydiving? Yes. Do I, I, I remember, remember that? that? I noticed that. I, yes. yes, I was previously here. Okay. But yes, I do enjoy it. I remember that from one of our past presentations. Um, and Abby was recently promoted as an executive director. So she was like you uh, for years as a leader in a therapeutic rec, uh, rec recreational therapist uh, department. And she was recently promoted just before COVID in a executive director uh, uh, position. So obviously, congratulations, Abby. Thank you again for uh, waiting uh, to uh, partner with me on today's presentation. And I'm excited and it's, honor, it's an honor to be with you today. About myself, briefly, um, I think the only thing that I'm, well, the thing that I'm the most proud of is, um, I was gonna make it a joke saying that I'm French, is my love for the older adults. I've, 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 I was very, very lucky to develop that at a young age uh, through family members. And, um, you know, to Amy's question before, what are you passionate about? For me, and I'm sure with everyone on the line, well, actually a lot of people, I'm sure, uh, my passion lies with the older adult and how we can improve their lives every day. So I'm proud of that because it makes me happy and it's something that I, I feel very, very lucky for. So um, Abby and I will be presenting again on It Begins With The Resin. So obviously we have to you know, take into account that today's world is not what it was six months ago. COVID has completely disrupted uh, what we do as professionals. And today's presentation is going to be focusing on person first, what it means, and uh, Amy was sharing that quality of care is part of quality of life. But if we put the person first, everything which is psychosocial, how do we take into account that? How do we work with that? And why would data matter, right? Um, and then the second part of our presentation today is going to be focusing on the good, the better, and the best approaches to uh, resident psychosocial information gathering, right? So the good, uh, I'll be sharing a little bit what we've started to see in our resident engagement index score. So I will be sharing with you exclusive data on how we're doing as an industry now. The better is Abby. I, she will be explaining a little bit some of her work. And again, uh, Abby comes from a position of what I think being one of the best professionals in today's market. And then Abby and I will share a little bit about what are the best approaches. What we hope to see coming soon or not and what we want the future to look like. And I think this is something that we'll all share, and it's good to also think about how can we improve. As I shared, feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A section, and we're going to get started. So person-centered care, or the idea of helping our residents find purpose every day, starts with them, simply. Right, there's no other way about it. And I think the best way to think about it and the best way to put into context the work of resident engagement, i.e. activity, life enrichment directors, wellness professionals, uh, rec therapists, or in Canada, as we say, therapeutic recreational therapists, the idea is our work can be put into the context of social determinants of health. And I know that many of you have already been on our webinars, but I think it's really important to put this in the context of the social determinants of health, which simply explains that everything that is socially based 
scanned amount for more than 70% of the outcomes of our uh, residents. So in other words, the work we do, the work Abby does, the work that you all do right now and every single day for all of your residents can account for more than 70% of the well-being of these residents. 30% is for medical and clinical. So that accounts for the importance and the potential that you can bring in uh, the older adults that you serve. In, and I think that's you know, more than showing that we are essential, it also shows how much potential there is in our work, right? We know, and this is one of my favorite quotes from Abraham Maslow, we know that a musician must make music, an artist must paint, a poet must, a poet must write. If he is ultimately to be at peace with himself, what a man can be, he must be, right? And this is um, how we help our residents find purpose, right? We are here to help them be the man or woman or be the people, the person they must be. There's a lot of different variation in the Japanese um, uh, culture. There's a concept called ikigai. Uh, all, sorts, all, of, all different societies have a different way of getting to purpose. But ultimately, our work is essential, and our work is about helping these residents be who they must be. I think that's why we show up, right? We show up at work. We show up because our passion lies in collaborating with residents to honor their preference so they can live every day with purpose. Now, why do I remind us of that? I remind us of that because as we are going through extremely challenging time, we have uh, gone through losses of all sorts of different kinds. We have met some of the biggest challenges our industry has ever met. And Brian Reif once, um, I saw one of his Facebook live video once, explained simply that every time you make that decision to show up at work and do this work, it is your own decision. And for me, this is why I so respect the work that you do, because every single time you make that decision, you help these residents live with purpose, and you help our industry uh, be more human, right? I think it is essential for us to really acknowledge and um, explain how essential that work is. Now, as much as I can talk about it, I have not been in one of these communities. I have not been in one of these homes for the past six months, and I miss that. But that is not the work that I do. And this is why I really was hoping, uh, and I'm excited to hear Abby's perspective on what COVID has, how it unfolded for her, and what are some of the key things that she's learned. I'm mute. Thank you so much, yeah. Charles for that introduction and getting us started. I first of all want to thank you for this opportunity to you know, be able to share some of our experiences, especially from, um, I know we have a lot of people from the US here, so from a can Canadian perspective as well. And of course, to you know, I'm, I've been reading through the chat and just really excited for everyone because yes, these um, gatherings help to reignite um, the flame and to keep us motivated and to inspire us. So we're definitely, um, I'm really excited to be able to share some of my experiences as well as um, some of the things that we need to continue doing within this field to um, continue to improve what we do. So let's go back to you know, the start of it all in um, with COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 has been, uh, has had a tremendous impact on long-term care homes. So as you know, um, coronavirus is particularly deadly for the elderly. Um, in Ontario, Canada, about 64% of COVID-19 deaths are in long-term care facilities alone. 
And thankfully, in Ontario, we have had less than 1% of deaths of healthcare workers. So we're very grateful of that. And I want everyone to always remember that the value of the work that you do during these times, especially, is priceless. And because if the residents, you know, clients, patients, what you may have it, what you call them in your setting, um, they're certainly lucky to have you by their side through it all. So I certainly thank you all for all that you do day in, day out, um, because, you know, it is a choice to continue to do so. But, you know, although we started off rough in from March till uh, right about now, since then and ongoingly, we've continued to learn and can, um, that how to, um, manage these COVID-19 uh, virus spreads within the homes. So we continue to learn and see what else um, we can do as preventative measures and of course be diligent with them. And we're certainly not out of the woods yet, but we'll continue to um, work towards, you know, making sure everyone is protected and healthy and safe. So with that being said, homes have met with a loss of about 40% of their workforce, which is within all departments. So registered staff, um, activity professionals, even down to you know housekeepers and you know people that work in the dietary department. And even more so, in a few cases, they're down to about 68% um, capacity of filled beds. So this is the impact of the deaths within the home and not being able to refill some of those beds, you know, that would have a great financial impact or more so, you know, having some residents who know that other residents have been, were in the home and for whatever reason, they may have died due to COVID or other natural causes. So in terms of impact on business staff and residents, homes have been mandated since about in Canada about March 17th to lock down with no visitors. Um, homes are in isolation and it's even worse when there is an outbreak. Um, so with residents and families not being able to connect, spend the time, see one another, the caregiver aspect of providing assistance to the staff within the homes um, with meal times and even helping with that connection that we need to um, help maintain the lives of our residents um, is missing. You know, further to that, volunteers may that used to provide you know additional assistance with engagement um, with activity department or you know assistance in various areas of the community are now um, missing in action. So these things have been, you know, gaps that we've seen happen over the last six months. And even more so, you know, the impact on the staff, their work and personal life. So having to make important decisions um, that may end up impacting their own families. I'm sure many people have stories. So I would go to, to ask like, how has this whole COVID experience pandemic affected you personally? Can anyone give me some um, ideas on how that has impacted you or is currently impacting you? Feel free to share in the chat session. Emotionally exhausted, yes, makes you angry. Absolutely receive the brunt of anger from family. We certainly have learned a lot more about not only residents, but also their family members throughout this entire process. You know, um, I've had times and moments where I felt overwhelmed as well, you know, not being able to see your own family. So um, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I'm certain, and as I can see from all the um, responses here, that each community and each person and where you work, you've had common and uh, very unique experiences during these past six months of uh, 2020. So I definitely appreciate you uh, sharing about how you've been feeling. Next slide, please, Charles. Okay, so when we're looking at this, this chart is from this um, line graph, is from the monthly usage of Link Senior. As with many homes um, that utilize Link Senior as a platform to engage residents, we can relate our experience to what we see in this um, graph. Um, when it all began in March, you know, in the height of all the cases and um, the governing bodies working to determine the public health measures that we all have to, you know, take on and protocols that we have to implement, it seems as, as though the rest of life came to a complete stop. So, you know, we, we know what we do, we have a way of, of, of 
going through the daily, you know, planning programs, implementing them, having our calendars and whatnot. But at that point in time, we had to just stop and see, okay, how is this going to work? How are we going to um, move forward in programming? What will this do to therapeutic recreation and um, as to what we need to do right now and onward? So as we're used to planning on a daily basis as to what um, will happen with our residents um, within the community. Next, next please. So we're all very familiar with these calendars. You know, um, so what kind of feelings does seeing this type of calendar evoke for you? What type of feelings when you see it? I'm sure you're all very quite familiar with seeing them around the home or you work directly into creating these calendars. Right, pointless, right. <laughs> so some like it and some definitely hate it, but nonetheless, we still plan it because of course we have to um, go in and have some sort of, you know, idea of what we're going to be doing tomorrow, the next day, the day after that. So um, some people do feel excited about it. And of course, you know, looking at it, you say, oh, does it really give flexibility? Um, Amy touched on some of the points that I will be discussing um, with you this afternoon. But in terms of how we um, plan and say, okay, we're going to have this program, this is what we're going to do with the residents, and then it just falling short or it just cannot go the way that we plan. So when we're, you know, we're looking at things, you know, some of the things that I see here that we're saying is that we, what is it, 50% wrong due to daily changes, absolutely, with the things that come up as we go through COVID-19, the mandates that the governments might put on, on us, such as visiting and um, visiting policies and, and the like. So we're, we're totally deviating from utilizing this calendar as a base. Even when you know I see our program director create calendars at this point, we really have to look at it as something that may or may not happen on a, on a daily basis because things may very well change. Well, it seems that those, those days of planning these calendars might be over right now. They may or may not come back, but we certainly cannot plan 40 days in advance right now. We just have to be flexible and just have the open mind to determine, okay, this is what we are informing everyone that we're doing. However, today might be a different day. Next slide, please, Charles. So we look back at uh, 2019 and you know uh, the five domains of wellness and what that looked like in the same time period from March to July of this year, 2020. And we can see that there was a very right away, a dramatic in increase in programs and activities within the social domain. And this was directly attributed to um, the increase in isolation from outbreaks having um, to be put in, be declared to the, like we mentioned before, Visit, visits from family, volunteers, entertainment, all sorts of, you know, um, visitors that would normally be coming into the home, not having the opportunity to do so, the program staff were then left to fill this gap. They're forced to now focus on one-to-one -one programming because at best, you may be able to gather maybe up to three people within a specific cohort, um, specific unit, that while you're still trying to achieve physical distances. So not only do you have to look at what the setting is providing in terms of what you are able to do to um, protect your residents, um, you also have to look at what is it that they'll really benefit from from a one-to-one -one basis. So residents are, um, staff are finding that, you know, you have to, you're starting to get to know people a bit more. And as I mentioned earlier, you get to know families quite a bit, having to plan uh, virtual visits and coordinate with them. And, you know, everyone's under pressure, under stress during this time and wanted to see mom or dad and you know the resident may not be having a good day but yet if they don't get this visit you know we might have repercussions to that um, at a later date with the family or with the resident so it's quite interesting that we we might think that we want to focus on the emotional and intellectual side of things and maybe spiritual during a pandemic but we're finding that it is it's essential to just learn who the person is 
and be able to get to them where it is with what they really need. So we're focusing on the social side a little bit more during this period specifically. And I'm thinking, you know, with the with the pandemic continuing on, we will likely have to um, look at the other domains as well as it pertains to the individual. And I see some questions here in terms of, are we talking about independent living um, uh, facilities as well? Well, it definitely applies because in long-term care, we not we don't only have uh, residents who are above 65 years old, just seniors, for example. We have residents who are maybe in their 40s who may be dealing with developmental um, disabilities. We have individuals who are um, dependent on, have mental health challenges. We have uh, people who were addicts to maybe alcohol or maybe it's drugs. So within long-term care, you have a varying range of uh, demographics and people that you um, have that are living there. Therefore, the importance of getting to know the individual is quintessential to even possibly even trying to make any sort of plan in terms of engagement. Um, we've, we saw an increase in the number of um, minutes that we utilize for Link Senior, for example, towards engagement. It, plummeted to about 5,000 um, minutes per month. And once we started figuring that, okay, technology has become the main source of engaging our residents with the outside community, we then saw a jump up to over 21,000 and have been keeping a steady of about 15,000 minutes per month as, um, you, as we're utilizing such platforms for our programming for one-to-one. Next slide, please. I wanted to ask you, Abby, what is the proportion of your one-on-one -on -one versus groups? For this time period, we noticed it was about 88% of our, um, we had more one-to-ones versus group group um, programming, whereas we could almost say it was about, you know, 50-50 because we're always looking for a good balance and um, based on the demographics that we have at the time, it would have been, you know, okay to say as such, but uh, there was a major shift towards one-to-one -to -one programming. So definitely close to 90%. So I'm gonna- What I find amazing, Abby, is, uh, I mean, your, your numbers are great and it's, it's uh, I know it's been tough for uh, your organization, the homes in your chain and, and your particular home, right? You, you've had more than one outbreaks, more than one challenges with the residents and family and staff, and still uh, your department is so resilient and again showing up at work to, to honor the preferences of your residents every single day. You know, what I find amazing with, sorry, you're gonna say something? No, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that one of the things that I find amazing about your data that you just shared is that is what we also see as a standard right now in the industry, right? We uh, do these uh, surveys because we love data. We love to understand what's the impact of, of COVID right now. And, um, you know, 89% of programming is delivered through one on one versus groups. You know, six months ago was probably the opposite in, in many, many cases. And, um, and that has created immense challenges for our departments because we're not staffed to work that way. Mm -hmm. A lot of our um, staff, like Amy was explaining, love to be social, love to be with a group, don't have the tools to do one-on-ones and doing a one-on-one -on -one is very different than a group setting. So, you know, it's it's part of the challenge, and it's why, like everything on earth right now, resident engagement is being disrupted. Now, I think it's important also to bear that in mind because that is the number one reason why we feel overworked, why why we might be depressed, why we're just exhausted, right? And we're six months in, and like if somebody very smart told me the other day, it's more difficult to reopen than to close. Right. It's uh, we don't know what it's going to be in, in a few weeks, a month. Um, we balance things between safety of our residents and the need for more than just isolation. Right. And like Abby was saying, or I think, well, like, yeah, like Abby was saying, you know, we might start to reopen, but we might have a risk of an outbreak and have to close down again temporarily. So there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. 
for us to really understand what's going on, like I shared with you, it's important to look at data. And I'm this is for me one of the most impactful uh, things to understand what is going on, right? So um, since COVID happened for a lot of different reasons, um, you know, our, our staff is really spread super thin or sometimes unable to perform their uh, duties, right, their, their job responsibilities. And I think it's really important to understand why. And we believe there's three main reasons why our, our, our job is so difficult, right? Before COVID-19, in many cases, we relied on help from the outside, such as musical performers, members of the clergy, or volunteers, or even family members that would come and help us engage our residents. Right. The second reason is groups is a great way to promote social uh, uh, engagement, but also, is also a great way for us to be if, a, efficient. Right. Put all the French people together because crazy French people like to be with crazy French people. But beyond that, it increases social engagement and help us be efficient. Right. Because of COVID, none of these visits happen anymore or on a very limited basis. And we cannot do groups as much as we did before, right? Some of, our, uh, some of the communities we've been speaking for weeks on could not do any groups whatsoever. And then the third aspect is just less time, right? We're managing PPE, we're managing ourselves, right? Like the idea of self-care is extremely important and it takes time and energy. But we're also helping other departments and we're pulled in all sorts of di different directions. You know, one of the big ones to these days is also family. So ultimately, this analysis, this data, helps us understand what we need to go and find in terms of hours per month if we wanted to do the same type of program we did before COVID, right? So, for example, if I work in a nursing home today, or uh, if I work in a nursing home today, I need to go and find 184 hours to get back to the same quality as before. And we know for a fact from NAP and NCAP that no one is really hiring until the end of the year and probably until early 2021. So how do we get out of this? Well, we get out of this one by understanding and taking a data-driven approach to resident engagement to see what's missing. And then we look into interdisciplinary work, getting help from other departments, and ways to be more efficient. And that includes best practices and technology and so on. But as we sit today on September 15th, you know, we're not out of the world, right? And this pandemic um, has, has, been, has been disruptive for all of our society. But the biggest area of uh, challenges and concern is where we work. It is the senior living and long-term care industry. And I think it's really important to help us uh, to, to be reminded of that, right? Where we work, our work is the one, is the type of uh, discipline and industry that has failed the most uh, because of this COVID-19 pandemic. And that has resulted in a huge, sad increase in social isolation. We knew prior to COVID-19 that social isolation was prevalent. And we know it's, it's, uh, it's very bad, right? There's a report from the AARP two years ago that explained that it's as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It increases the chances of dementia by 20%. And social isolation has become actually the biggest challenge in our industry right after COVID. So this is extremely sad. Um, but like Amy was saying, and Abby said it as well, there is also a silver lining, which is it's also created um, fantastic opportunities for us. It's shed light on our important work, and for the first time ever, people, the industry, place res engagement as a crucial business driving force. They understand, we all know now, that we need to engage our residents 
in the most person-centered way. And like I shared with you, you know, how do we get out there? Well, some of the things, how do we get out of this uh, situation is through different opportunities. Some of it is actually happening. One of the uh, crucial data points that I'm happy to share with you is that help from other departments since the beginning of COVID has doubled, right? You know, I started Link Senior, I think 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and at the time I, I went through MEPAP 1, to under, you know, the Certification for Activity Directors to understand what you all do. And I remember at the time the teacher saying, you know, how important universe, the universal worker concept is. And I think that we've been begging for help from other departments. And prior to COVID, it did happen, uh, depending on our communities, but it was not the norm. And thanks to COVID, anyway now, and we really hope it's going to stay that way, um, that has doubled, right? 70%, 69% of us are um, getting help from other departments. So that's a really cool and exciting and promising data point. But I want to share with you the one that for me is the most important, which is the fact that the vast majority of us believe that we're going to get out stronger. Why is that so important? Well, it's so important because as challenging things can be today, we have hope. We have optimism. And as a fantastically resilient and creative discipline, where we've seen this on Facebook, uh, the media hasn't been fair all the time, but it sometimes highlighted fantastic work that you've all been doing. I think there's light around, uh, uh, through the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel, and that light and world is actually fantastic for activity and life enrichment directors. So, you know, as I shared with you, thank you for the work that you do. We will get out of this, and like most of you believe, we will get out of this stronger. Now, how do we get out of this, right? This is the crucial part of our presentation, is taking into uh, account the different uh, good, better, and best approaches to resonant psychosocial information gathering. So the first part I'm going to share is through the uh, RISE tool that we have, the Resonant Engagement Index Score. As I shared previously, it is the first of its kind tool that is research-based, data-driven, so that we can self-assess our work, not ourselves, the work that organization does, so that we can measure and improve our work. Right? The idea is to have a benchmark so we can create a goal and therefore improve and deliver even more in improving the life of our quality of life, sorry, improving the quality of life of our residents. Now, as you can see, leading experts and uh, organizations have contributed to such tool. And I'm very excited because I'm about to share with you exclusive data that we just analyzed from uh, this tool. The first piece that we want to share with you is how many data points, how many preferences are we collecting on our residents, right? So the right tool tells us that today, we are uh, gathering 29.2 preference data points in independent living up to 34.3 in the nursing home environment. What does that tell us? That tells us that if we're lower than that, we obviously seek to improve. If we're higher, that is also, that's actually great. Now we, we should never seek to imp uh, stop to improve. But these are the benchmarks, and this is the first time that a tool like this has been implemented and that someone has analyzed that information. The other data point that we wanted to share that pertains to today's presentation is the way we are sharing, uh, or the way we're storing our information, right? Is it paper, which is good because it shows as a process, or is it electronic, which is better, because electronic means it's shared, it's analyzed, it's stored, and so on and so on. 
And as you can see, it increases with the need uh, of, of support of our residents, which is not a surprise. But I was pleasantly pleased, surprised to see myself that in IL, almost a third of us already do that electronically, which is very promising. I think that COVID has something to do with it, and it is only going to accelerate that process. Right? We believe, the Activity Strong Initiative believes that gathering preferences electronically is a best practice. So if you need any information or um, uh, information about this and to promote the idea, please feel free to reach out. The third and last uh, data point that I want to share with you is also in that respect, and it is a little bit surprising, which is um, do activity life enrichment directors have access to this data anytime, anywhere? And as you can see, it also increases with uh, our level of care. Now, sadly, it goes down for uh, the nursing home environment. And although we haven't been able to interview, uh, we've interviewed a few, but not a lot of, of staff, we believe that the main reason that is, is that there is a lack of funding across the board, obviously, but especially in the nursing home environment. And we believe that this lack of funding results in a lack of tool for activity and life enrichment professional in this particular level of care for them to have the tools, in this case, to be able to access preferences anytime, anywhere. Again, it is a belief from the Activity Strong Initiative that data needs to be gathered electronically and made it available for our staff so they can use it anytime, anywhere. So with that, this is the benchmark today. It will hopefully improve quickly, especially with COVID. But this is what um, the best, like the average of, of, our, of our industry today. It's with excitement that we're going to hear from us, from Abby, sorry, what the best do, right? Abby, a leader in, as a recreational therapist and our executive director in her home, is now going to share with us what is being done um, with her team. You, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so sure. I will take this back to the very um, start of it all. Of course, you know, we have COVID, we have um, taken place. I'm just going to piggyback a bit into um, some of what Amy has discussed earlier in the earlier sessions. I'm going through the processes that, although we have a pandemic happening um, with incoming, you know, residents and even having to go back to the residents that we um, have had in the home, having to reassess. So the assessment uh, phase, you know, of course, with uh, therapeutic recreation service delivery, you should always involve the family, any other support networks um, at all appropriate stages of, you know, intervention planning and assessment and gathering of this data to help to guide your decisions as to what you will plan and implement for a specific resident. Um, you know, we have done assessments for these folks, you know, they, some of them may have been living at the home for 13 years, even more, and some may have just come uh, just before COVID has started. But it might, it is important to go back and reassess these things that you know, because a lot of it may have changed based on the these, the the disease process and even, um, you know, the new ailments that the new challenges and ailments that the resident may have, you know, um, now adapted to or have have been or diagno diagnosed with. So it's important that we look at all aspects of, of this individual, their goals that they may have, uh, their beliefs, and of course their perspectives on how they see things. So it's important that for optimal client outcomes that we're directly relating our understanding of their social, their cultural and um, attitudinal and even their environmental influences of that specific individual. I'll give you examples along the way. So it is a uh, part of the, you know, planning process to, to, to look at this individual and say, okay, for example, we have a resident now that we, um, the homes now have to be um, on isolation, the, we can have visitors, uh, residents can't leave the property. 
what do we do? We have specific residents who are very independent and do want to explore their community like they normally do. They may not be able to cognitively understand the risks involved in uh, going out to the community and potentially um, the transmission of COVID-19, but we're able to say, okay, I have a specific resident who has a background in um, construction and landscaping. What do we do for this individual now that he cannot go in the community? One of his passions is to go for walks and explore his local community. Now having these restrictions, how do we ensure that this individual is safe and is able to um, still engage in activities that are of his passion and of his interest? We know that his, about his history. So having to you know, speak with the, uh, the interprofessional team, determining that, okay, this individual can actually be, um, in essence, our grounds person. You know, they can only go within the uh, perimeters of the property. So why not allow them the opportunity to do so by being able to take care of, you know, the grass areas, the plants within um, around the home setting to make everything look beautiful and just engaging them in such a way that they won't feel the need to wander off as they may be or just decide to ultimately leave the home's property and our what we call our safe zone um, and then be at risk. So we had to go back and re review this individual's assessment and see what it is that we can newly learn from even the family members or even um, the staff that have continuously worked with this individuals. For example, PSWs, they're able to give us insight on, okay, is this person, um, what, are, what do they normally do on a daily basis if our program staff are not usually aware of it? Uh, what is their schedule? What is that the person's routine? And how can we go back and develop a plan that will that we can implement to make sure that they're safe one you know that was the ultimate uh, goal make sure that they're safe and of course um, engaged to make sure that we're maintaining at least maintaining the quality of life of this individual so it's important that we always look at what our clients perspective is um, and what their internal goals, their intrinsic goals that they may potentially have, and for them to have the autonomy to decide what it is that they can and cannot do. Of course, this will, as we talk, um, depend on the specific individuals and their capabilities. So looking at that person um, through the eyes of you know, the family members, um, what the resident has continuously engaged in or has shown interest to engage in, and um, even the supports around the home. And of course, looking at our interdisciplinary team to determine what answers can we get from the clinicians, um, what from physiotherapy, what can this person do um, that we haven't thought of? Is it safe for them to climb a ladder maybe to help with decorating the home, which is one of the things that we were able to accomplish with this specific individual. But we have to really go back and reassess if we haven't already completed a thorough assessment based on this individual's uh, preferences and their own personal um, goals. So during COVID-19 outbreaks, you know, as I said, we're revisiting our preconceived ideas of how we're programming. You know, staff are having to focus on these one-to-one -one interventions, closely monitoring and um, really observing our residents as they're having limited interactions. They may have been able to go from floor to floor to um, explore the home and visit with friends, but that's something that may not be allowed um, at this time in your home. But um, as we know, within cohorting and making sure that we are uh, not, uh, we're keeping safe and limiting the spread of COVID-19, of course, we had to um, implement such things. So how does this impact those with cognitive and mental health challenges? Of course, your plans may not um, work, uh, but we have to, like I said, collaborate and find the supports that are necessary to be able to dig deep, deep and deeper uh, to be able to have um, some of these goals accomplished. Uh, during this phase, we're still continuing to mold new ways of achieving these same goals that we have had with our residents. But again, the stronger focus is on the individual in terms of how to maintain their capabilities while being isolated. You know, much work is, is being done to rediscover how we'll move forward knowing what we now know about um, the processes that that needs to entail. Next slide, please, Charles. 
So of course, as you know, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, but after assessment is the intervention plan. So we're developing the intervention goals and the objectives based on the assessment results that we've um, gathered, um, that they're specific, they're of course measurable, they're action oriented, realistic, and time specific. Um, determine the, the level of support that will be necessary to achieve meaningful involvement um, in these interventions. So are we able to have this individual um, explore the grounds of the home and do what he needs to do without supervision, without assistance, without reminders, or do we need to have a program therapist who can be alongside with them ensuring that they're um, participating in these activities in a safe manner, um, depend on the person's cognitive um, um, capabilities. So these are the areas that you must and cannot um, overlook that has to be determined to make sure that they are safe. So referring to appropriate professionals to answer even some of the client's questions that are beyond our scope of practice. So for example, we had um, to help our residents understand uh, what's happening in the community and globally with this pandemic, uh, creating dementia-specific uh, wording and postings in and around the home areas to why are staff wearing masks? Um, what is COVID-19? Uh, what happens if you get sick with COVID-19? So the types of symptoms that you may experience, just so that we have our residents involved and informed so that if they're able to cognitively participate and help to um, with the preventative measures that we have their buy-in to do so. Even having um, talking points for our staff in terms of when some of these questions occur, you know, a resident saying, look, I need to go to the bank um, and they can independently do so on a regular day, but with the new um, way of living with COVID-19, how do we explore and make sure that happens for that individual? So then collaborating with our social service worker, for example, who has a strong relationship and has built rapport with this individual to maybe um, at, uh, go with them to this excursion to go to the bank, for example. So if it's safe to do so. So we're really looking at, although we have our restrictions are in place, but what do we do as individuals in our daily lives to ensure that we're accomplishing some of our daily goals and some of the must do's that we need to do to be able to feel purposeful and fulfilled. We are definitely definitely looking at um, beyond the scope of practice of therapeutic recreation in that way by having an interdisciplinary approach and of course involving all the necessary supports. So we cannot develop any plans without the insights of these various entities who are a part of and can impact the, in the person's daily life. You know, as I mentioned before, behavioral support, personal support workers, physiotherapy, and the like. And then we go into program development, providing clients, um, residents with a range of opportunities for functional intervention, leisure education, and recreation participation. So we're looking at the different levels of what is it that they can actually do, meeting them where they exactly are. We have a resident, for example, who likes to just explore the areas of the home, but we're able to you know, leave markers and say, okay, you can go within these areas and continuously provide reminders. We have at our reception desk, some of these talking points um, just posted so that anyone that's sitting at the reception desk will know that if any of our residents are going outside, maybe for a smoke even, they are um, reminded of all the different precautions that they must take. Maybe it's masking, maybe it's um, achieving physical distancing while they're out smoking. Maybe it's simply as don't talk to strangers while you're out there, just because um, based on our geographic location, we're right on the main street and um, any kind of interaction may occur with the local community and we want to mitigate those risks. So when we're you know, thinking of our smokers, for example, and developing a plan for them to make sure that they're still able to to achieve their you know, personal goals of getting the number of cigarettes that they need each day, because that may lead to you know, um, resulting in behaviors if we decided to um, restrict them from doing that. How are the, be the safest ways to ensure that that's taking place? And how is that communicated to the team, the interdisciplinary team, so that you know, one person won't say, oh, you're not allowed to go because we can't go in the community. And another person saying, sure thing, you can um, go anytime. We're making sure that this is also explained and um, 
illustrated in their care plans so that all are aware. So of course, um, determining the program protocols and proposing it to the individual to ensure that they understand what the goal is and um, the outcome and able to share with you how that can truly work and how realistic it is. Of course, identifying and the risk management practices, as I said, for infection control, making sure there's hand hygiene that's happening, um, making sure that um, equipment and all areas are um, in good repair and working conditions. Because if our residents are restricted to being inside the home, we need to make sure it's a safe environment, that everything that they need is actually within our care facility. Next slide, please. Abby, just as an FYI, we have about five minutes left. Yes, I'm getting it going. <laughs> so for program delivery, of course, understanding that, you know, this very program that you took all this, these weeks, the time, you know, days, hours to develop may not be successful. So we have to ensure that the delivery is person-centered. Um, the leisure-based programs are responsive and reflective of um, the client's strengths and interests and cultures, um, and making sure that we're demonstrating the ability to use various intervention facilitation techniques in this delivery of this program with the intention of maximizing the benefits to the resident, whether it's stress management during this time, um, relaxation and coping, and um, you know some leisure education as well, because sometimes you do need to educate residents on how to go about achieving their same, um, their same engagement levels. Um, next slide. So having from having a resident who um, used to play soccer and not being able to go to soccer programs within the community, for example, um, and implementing a foosball kind of tournament within the home where they can play with the staff or um, with another resident where you're still able to achieve distance and also be able to engage in um, some of your particular interests. May not be actual, um, be the playing of the actual game, but it does give the same um, level of enjoyment because they are um, in essence controlling a player to play as them. So those type of things um, we went to look at the providing the necessary adaptations and modifications to of course maximize their participation and independence next slide And of course, documentation, um, the importance of communicating these assessments, these intervention plans, um, the client's progress um, in, in this pro process. Their caregivers have to be, families included, have to be involved in this process as well, and relevant you know, professionals and advocating for the residents in terms of what they are able to participate in um, and what we can certainly um, do for them and make sure that we're all on the same page in that regard. So summarizing the client's involvement in the intervention um, by including, you know, frequency, duration, and the level of participation is important and will help towards our, the evaluation process, which is also very important in is having an ongoing review of the client's um, therapeutic recreation intervention plan to review their goals and these same objectives and discussing their progress with them and with the team members so that we're all in on the same page in terms of how we can provide the supports. And of course, identifying the areas that we need to modify and to that would best benefit our residents in achieving their goals. And of course, understanding that at, there will be times where we have to terminate these interventions um, where goals are, have either been achieved or is just not successful and we'll have to go back to the drawing board. Next slide. So of course we're looking at, you know, what can we do? Can we make, uh, what more can we dream of and um, dream up? And what are the innermost wishes of those that we serve in these communities? And how do we make these wishes true, come true? Next slide, please. Of course, uh, before that, just the slide before, please, Charles. Okay, 
to the bucket list. Of course, growing up, you know, even more so now, um, we may have, you know, with life being short of that concept of it, having a stronger understanding of, you know, having a bucket list before you kick the bucket, so to say. Um, so as we go through the processes of assessments, planning, implementation, and evaluating, but, you know, just gathering and creating a list of different wishes of residents. You can start small from, you know, wanting to watch a, a hockey game on, you know, it's always streaming and you can probably find something that relates to the individual. But, you know, Amy referred to um, flying, for example, and I have had an experience myself where we had a program for resident wishes and we would nominate residents, staff would and other residents would nominate one another um, to when we're able to select and save up money to have a resident who has always wanted to fly a Cessna airplane and wasn't able to because he was, he found out, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at a very young age and um, the progression of the disease was quite rapid for that individual and just thinking that this is something that can never happen. But, you know, having the staff and the team being on the same page and being able to explore safe ways of doing so, we were able to accomplish that one goal of that individual. And, you know, hearing from that person and them saying, you know, if I die now, I'm going to die with a smile. I'm sure they have many other things that they would want to do other things, but just being able to, you know, um, achieve that goal for them has been um, very fulfilling for the team as well as for the individual. Next slide. I'm just going to wrap it up here. So, of course, the environment, environment, making sure the person feels at home, you know, um, from pictures of family and loved ones, whatever that may look like, um, to just, you know, thinking about the future. What does long-term care, for example, look like? Um, when building these facilities, can we focus on our the needs of our demographic to make sure that we're creating, for example, from memory care, um, scenery and scenery that's appropriate and an escape for the individual. So to make sure that we're always keeping up to date with the best practices and looking at the tons of resources that are available um, worldwide um, for them to be for us to be inspired and continuously motivated in in our work. So we must continue to think outside the box and of course safely making sure that we're mitigating risk. But it's one thing I learned when I was in school was that possibilities are endless. So you can always look at a different way of doing things and always achieve it in the best way possible to fulfill the needs of our residents. Charles, I'll give it over to you. Thank you so much, Abby. This was a great uh, presentation. In the chat, people were, you know, congratulating you on your glasses, but way beyond also discussing some ideas himself and, and thanking some thanking you for some of your comments and ideas. You know, ultimately, I be I um, I think I've told you many times it's an honor to be able to work with people like you because the work that you do is essential uh, for industry and obviously essential for our residents so they can find purpose every day. So thank you again for contributing and sharing some of your best practices. You know, you've lived COVID closer than I have. And I know, or at least I've heard that it is extremely challenging. So thank you for what you do and thank you for being with us today. If anyone has any questions for Abby or myself, our contacts are here on the presentation, on the presentation slide. And I'm going to stop the recording here and move to our third, last, but definitely